Good to see everyone tonight. We are going to uh, continue in our Bible study on the history of the New Testament church. Hopefully this has been all right. I've enjoyed it. Um, so why don't we pray? I know we prayed in the other room, but let's just pray and ask Jesus to be with us tonight. Amen. Hun, you want to pray? God, you are so good, and we're Thank thankful you, for this opportunity to come yes, together Lord. now and just to just dig into your Bless word. Bless us, Lord. Lord. Minister pray, Jesus. God, that the, Jesus. the written word would become a living word within our hearts, God, that it would direct and guide yes, and just open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us today. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Sister Vicki, would you like to read? You can open up tonight. You'll have Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Brother John, do you want to get Acts 2 and 38? And Sharon, do you want to get Acts, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Matthew 16, 18 and 19? All right, so I just titled this tonight, They Continued. And I know we talked a little bit last week about some things we were going to cover, and I kind of, I think I got a little bit out of order of what I wanted to do. I mentioned about three different things. I said, next week we're going to talk about this, and we're not. So we're talking about Acts chapter 2, and verse 42 is going to be our main main scripture. So go ahead, Sister Vicki, read her loud so everyone can hear. They were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instruction of the apostles and to the fellowship to eating meals together and to prayers. A sense of awe was felt by everyone and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed in Jesus as Savior were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing the proceeds with all other believers as anyone had need. Day after day they met in the temple Continuing with one mind and breaking bread in various private homes, they were eating their meals together with joy and generous hearts, praising God continually and having favor with all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. So Acts 2.42 is our key verse, and uh, I have the King James Version here. Um, it says, they continued steadfastly, and that's what Sister Vicki said in those four things, the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Excuse me. So as we've discussed uh, before, the book of Acts is the history of the New Testament church. It's where it began. We talked a little bit last week. In Acts 1, um, Luke continues his message about the teachings of Jesus and the promise of the Holy Ghost. He said they waited in Jerusalem until they were filled with power from on high. And then it also covers the ascension of Jesus. If you read that story, what happens? Uh, he, he told them to keep doing what he had done, all the teachings that he had taught, and then he went up into heaven and they stayed there looking up, right? And the angel said, why are you staring? <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he will come back in the same way that he left, but go and wait in Jerusalem. And then also uh, Peter and the apostles rose up in those days. And, of course, Judas was one of the 12. He's the one that betrayed Jesus. And they chose two people after they had prayed. And Matthias was the one that their lot fell on. They cast lots and uh, trusted God. So they prayed, and then Matthias became one of the 12 apostles. In Acts 2, we talked about the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of God's Spirit, and Peter's message that aligned with the prophet Joel in Joel 2.28. Brother John, do you want to read Acts 2.38? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, um, we, uh, we are still part of the New Testament church, aren't we? Right, because it has not ended. Jesus has not come back yet. Right. Um, so even though the other books that were written have an ending and a conclusion, the book of Acts does not have an ending or a conclusion um, because we are still making history. 
and it's important to know really about those things that they continued in because we want to mimic the New Testament church, don't we? Yes, we do. Right? I mean, if we're the New Testament church and this the church that Jesus started and wrote, God wrote in his word about, we want to make sure that we can identify with them and that we can uh, mirror their teachings, that we can follow what they believed and do what they did and behaved how they behaved, all of those things. But we also know that there can be also sometimes cultural differences, right? right. So I think it's important to try to understand some of those things uh, culturally as well as really what God does not want to change and how he does want to minister to our lives. Amen. So Peter was the one who preached. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but uh, it really stems from this verse in Matthew 16 and 18. Sharon's going to read. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Right. Can you explain that? I've always been in authority. Yeah. As far loosed as. Loosed in heaven and loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven or be bound in heaven. Yeah. Earth. Whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. He's talking about in the in the heavenly places. So when we bind things, it's, it's kind of like a decree. He's giving him authority, not just to Peter, but also to the church. Um, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, whether, you know, if you want to, you know, we pray sometimes, God, uh, let there be a, an element of faith in this place. So we pray for faith to like a, a supernatural empowering of faith in a service or for somebody to be healed or something like that. Or whether it's spiritual things taking authority over them. What, God, what Jesus was telling Peter was, I'm giving you authority as my church on this earth. And our prayers, of course, we know affect also in heaven. So, is that well, help? I, I guess it, there's always been a contention that it just didn't, it doesn't sound that just on that type of situation. Meaning, I guess I, I don't understand well, you, the question you, completely. Well, so, if you would. Well, again, I think that for obviously there's no sin in heaven. Right. Right. But um, I guess the way I understand it is that there is also heavenly, you know, the devil is the prince and power of the air. We fight spiritual wickedness in high places. So uh, though it may not be heaven as far as God's throne, the way I understand that is... Um, that it will be uh, just over those spiritual high places of spiritual wickedness, authorities, dominions, principalities, and powers. And maybe this helps too. This is the amplified version that talks about and says, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind declared to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose declared lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven referring back to Isaiah 22 and 22. And it's kind of giving not only just authority, but in agreement, mm -hmm. saying that you're going to be in agreement with God in heaven and those... Uh, yeah, so you can't bind anything in heaven. Well, I think it's saying it, I think we have to look at it a little backwards, maybe. You know, they're saying it backwards to what I would perceive it to be, and maybe that's where you're thinking of it also. So whatever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's already 
yeah. of the will of God in heaven. Okay. So speak it as truth here on earth. Whatever you loose on earth, like loose faith or you loose a, a sense of peace over the capital on earth, it's already been loosed in heaven. The peace is already there yeah, in heaven so to be loosed. Okay, so whatever is loosed in, loosed in heaven, let it be loosed on earth. Right, yes. you can think of it that way. Yeah. It's just said kind of backwards to our, my thinking anyway right. in the scriptures. And it's referring back to Isaiah 22, 22, which says, amplified here, but in the key of the house of David, I will lay upon his shoulder. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. And I think what's so incredible is who was the one that preached on the first day of Pentecost, right? His message was brand new. Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever heard what he preached before until that point, right? After they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think when you think about that, that was already declared in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. But it was Peter that was given the keys right. to the kingdom of heaven, and he's the one that had that authority to Loose declare it. what was, yes. It on earth. Yeah. yeah. So, right. so you look at it in reverse. Right. What Sister Vicky said, then it, because there's no way it that we sense. can find something here on earth and have it bound in heaven. You know, right, if, if it's bound yeah. in heaven, we can release it here. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's really interesting, though, related to the door, right? Of that he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. And Jesus also said that in Revelation as well. Right. You know, I've set before you an open door. No man can shut it. And so when God opens those things spiritually, he's giving authority and power to his church. And this is really the, I mean, there are certainly people in the Old Testament who had power and authority with God, right? God's spirit was upon them or God's spirit moved upon them. But now this is a little different because Jesus being the high priest is pouring out all that he has upon his people and he's saying you no longer have to go when he says you don't have to go to a person it's not talking about you don't need authority anymore what he's saying is you don't have to go to that one high priest once a year on the day of atonement and get your need get your healing get all those things now we have jesus as a high priest who's already gone in through the veil because he went to hell into the grave defeated death hell in the grave and then rose again with all power and authority he had it before but now he's made a show of that openly, the Bible says. And so what his plan has always been, he is allowing his church to fulfill beginning on this day, day of Pentecost. Well, it's in, he, was, he was almost prophesying, <laughs> a short-term prophecy, if you will, in Matthew. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so then Peter, like my wife mentioned, we always hear Peter having the keys to the gates of heaven. Peter's going to be at the pearly gates. Uh, it's because of this verse. But it's talking about he's going to give that message that you read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which confirmed, as we're going to talk about even John chapter 3, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And, and it says in that same verse that it says, I'll give you the keys upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Yeah. Uh, the rock is Peter. The, he says, um, thou art Peter, and that translation means Petros. Petros, which means a small stone. But upon this rock, and that word is Petra, which means like a boulder, referring to himself, I will build my church. So he's saying you are, and the Bible calls us lively stones as well throughout uh, the word of God. Um, because it's talking about foundations. But he is the, the main foundation, then we're built upon right. top of him. So, any more discussion on that? It's a good point. It's a good question to bring up. A lot of times we just read over stuff and read over stuff and for many years, you know, and it's, it's good to ask questions. Um, so, 3,000 were added to the 120, right? That's what it's talking about right before the opening text here. Uh, Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and then they that gladly received his word, it says were baptized, and there was added unto them 3,000 souls. So 3,000 were added to the 120, which were the apostles and Jesus, some of Jesus' family and other followers. 
so the main key here, or the main, the main point in this portion of Scripture that I'd like to bring out is that fellowship, if you, if you will, or organization and structure was formed at that point. 3,000, and think about it this way. Here's 120 people who have been with Jesus for three years, right? They knew him. They knew his teachings. They are now filled with his spirit, according to the promise of God. So uh, we're going to talk about Acts 1 and 8. They received power. He said, Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. So here are these individuals anointed, filled with God's Spirit. They know Jesus. They've been with him. He's taught them. Uh, Some of the teachings just finally clicked right near the end, like the one about serving right before his crucifixion on the Passover. He put on a towel and once again showed him that he was a servant. So imagine yourself being a group of 120, and all of a sudden you got 3,000 new people who are Jews. They know the culture. They know the law and the prophets, but they need to have that expounded to them about Jesus Christ before they go home because they're from all over. So that was a big job. Yeah. Maybe they stayed in Jerusalem for a while. I don't know. But... uh, if you read in Acts chapter 2 and I think it's 36 and 37 when they were all wondering what this means because they heard him speaking, as we read last week, in their own tongues, Medes, Persians, all these people from all over, they had a home to go to, but they needed to be discipled. Even though they were Jews, even though they were familiar with the culture, the law of Moses, they needed to have that, all of that brought to light through the, through the teaching of Jesus Christ to them. So... They, they formed this organization, if you will. Uh, the Bible says God is not the author of confusion, but God is a God of structure. God's a God of order, right? Um, he didn't just say, oh, wow, you guys received this great gift. Good, go on, enjoy it. <laughs> you know, he wanted there to be some structure. So they continued in those four things, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. So... Let's look a little bit tonight. We're going to mainly look tonight at the first one there, the Apostles' Doctrine. The word apostles there means a delegate or an ambassador of the gospel or a commissioner of Christ. And it comes from the word, interestingly, to set apart. And what did uh, what did Jesus say? He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um, the other verse, what's the other verse? I'm thinking of to set apart. Um, Come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. So that word apostle means set apart. And then doctrine means instruction and it comes from the word to teach. So what was in this doctrine? What When they continued in the apostles' doctrine uh, along with the fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, which we'll talk about, Next week, what was in it? You ever think about that? The doctrine, which one? The Yeah, I'm sure that that was in there. Yeah. So a lifestyle of worship. Worship. What does uh, Acts 1 and 1 say? The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. So Luke was writing to Theophilus. Theophilus is mentioned in the book of Luke. He says, the former letter I've made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So Luke is saying, I, I wrote a letter, that other treatise, that other thing I put together, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So I believe that part of the, the doctrine was everything that Jesus did and taught, right? 
which is a lot, and it would take a long time to cover all that. So we're going to look at some, some key ones. They were Jewish, right? So they were to follow the ceremonial, or they were to follow the, the law of Moses. They knew the law of Moses. So that was part of their, they're indoctrinated with that. That was part of their fiber. Yeah. Um, but they also understood that when it came to the ceremonial law, Jesus fulfilled that as far as offering sacrifices and, and things like that. So we see, as we talked about a little bit last week, God began to begin to uh, kind of change some things according to their diet from the Old Testament. He, he changed some things in that, right? From the Old Testament to the New Testament. But we know Jesus was the lamb that was slain, so he came to fulfill all that ceremonial law of offerings and and and. Uh, the Day of Atonement, and all of those things, sacrifices, all of those things. It tells us in Matthew 27 and 37, Jesus is speaking, and he says to a young ruler, he says, when asked what are the greatest two commandments, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22. Yep, yeah, Matthew 22 and 37 is, is where that's found. I believe it's found in uh, Luke as well. Um, but he said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbors yourself. So basically all of my teachings are going to fall under these two categories, your relationship with God so how we're to serve God, how we're to love God, how we're to please him, whether that's um, things we're to do, things we're not to do, how we're to behave, the lifestyles that we live, all of those things, and then how we live with each other, how we're to treat one another, right? And we've talked about the Ten Commandments before, how those first four deal with us and God, and the last six deal with us and each other. So I, I really believe that the Bible shows us what the first two teachings of the apostles were. Um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 14 through 36, it tells us that Peter begins to preach to the crowd when they said, they were in doubt saying to one to another, what does this mean? And others mocking said, these men are drunk. So in verse 14, it says, Peter stood up, with the eleven and lifted up his voice and said unto them and then he begins to preach all the way through verse 36 and verse 36 he says therefore and this is the, i believe that this is the the key to everything he just said let all the house of israel know assuredly that god hath made that same jesus whom ye have crucified both both. I think sometimes we use Lord and Christ as synonymously, right? But he's saying both Lord and Christ. Yeah. Both our supreme ruler, both the mighty God and our Christ, our Messiah, our Redeemer. Yeah, Jesus the Christ. Yeah. The man. Jesus. Yes, the man, yeah. So God made that to be. So I really think that that was the first teaching um and even when it talks about his name we talked about uh, his name on sunday mornings so it says in isaiah 9 6 and 7 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given this is prophecy about jesus's birth and the government or the authority the ability to rule shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, so it's going his increase of authority is, and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, again, that coincides with what Peter talked about all through that second chapter. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth 
even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So in that first teaching there, he was telling them about who God was, who the authority was that God had given, and really who Jesus was, and talking about him and his name. Another verse I wanted to throw in there also is Colossians three sixteen and 17. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word of Christ. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all, it says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So I, I really do believe that the first teaching that they taught them, one of the first doctrines of the apostles was who Jesus was. That there has got to be an understanding. No man can come to God unless he believes that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, the Bible says. Without faith, is it impossible to please him? It's, that's a verse right before that. Without faith, it's impossible to believe him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I think that's Hebrews 1. And uh, so we have to... We have to believe in God. Jesus said, you believe in God, you believe also in me, right? So that first doctrine, I really think that they taught and what they tried to get across to their Jewish culture was that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be, exactly who he declared to be, both Lord and Christ, because they didn't believe him to be either. You know, uh, some of them, you know, even the woman at the well said, we know the Messiah is going to come. And Jesus had to tell her, I'm, I'm the Messiah. The one you're talking to is the, who you're waiting to come, right? And uh, the Pharisees, tell us plainly whether or not you are the Christ. And he's like, you've heard me teach. You've seen everything I've done if you don't get it by now. You know, so what the, what the disciples and apostles taught as far as their doctrine, I think the, one of the first things was, that you need to know who Jesus is. The second one, I think, is was mentioned by somebody, and that's that Acts 2.38 message of salvation. So let's discuss that a little bit. What does that look like? Salvation's an important topic. If we can't come to God unless we believe that he is, so faith in God has to come first, right? And the Bible also says no, no person can... Um, and I'm not going to quote it exactly, but nobody can come to the Lord except the Spirit of God first dwell him. Draw him, not dwell him. Draw him. Um, so when we look at salvation, that's an important topic. So after we realize who he is, we need to enter into that covenant relationship with him. Right? Right? Right. So couple of scriptures that are out there repent and believe the gospel uh, this gospel i think you used this the other uh, day at service this gospel shall be preached among all nations in my name beginning right. first at jerusalem and and he says and then shall the end come, the end come. right so the gospel is the good news right. the passion of jesus christ so when we look at that message of peter and if that's part of the apostles' doctrine, if Peter's message of repent, be baptized, and the word baptized means to cover completely with a liquid, right? It doesn't say sprinkle. It doesn't say pour. It doesn't say any other, <laughs> any other uh, typology of that. It means to cover completely with a liquid. And in the name of Jesus Christ, it says. It's talking about his name. And you shall receive the gift or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How does that, where, where does that come in Jesus' teaching? We know he preached repentance. So how did he, of all that Jesus be, both began to do and teach, Luke said, right? Mm -hmm. I know we know this. He came to be himself. 
the example of himself, became obedient unto death, the Bible says, even the death of the cross. I'm looking for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's what Paul said. Right. We're buried with him in baptism. You know, like throwing a handful of dirt on a dead body, that's not burying it. Right. Just like throwing a little bit of water on somebody isn't baptizing him. Right. Yeah. I think what's so interesting is you take it even back further to the Old Testament tabernacle. The very first time that the priests were dedicated, it says they had to wash with all. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so before Jesus started his ministry, what did he do? He had John the Baptist yeah. baptize him. Right, right. Wash with all. After that, all they would do is wash their hands and their feet at the labor of water when they would come and go. And what does the, te- the Bible talk about like in the New Testament? After that initial kind of baptism of truly washing away your sins. Um, we're washed by the watering the of the word. Of sins, we're right. washed by the watering of the word. Right. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to continue reading the word of God to keep yeah. his word and that purity into our lives and into our heart. And it's just so awesome when you compare that Old Testament and how Jesus became the example of that and then how that comes to the New Testament into our life today and how we continue with that. Oh, that's a whole, I love that Bible study of the, of whether it's, um, you know, the example of Noah, you know, of having faith in God, being saved by grace, but having faith and building the ark, responding to what God's warning was, mm-hmm. and that grace, faith, and obedience Grace, grace isn't just a new New Testament doctrine. It was all throughout the Old Testament. Right. And then what Sharon said about the Old Testament where they killed the lamb, right, on the Passover, and that was a representation of Jesus. They took the blood, applied it to the doorposts of their house so the death angel passed over. And then 50 days later, like we talked about at our first uh, lesson in this series, they got the Ten Commandments or the law on top of Mount Sinai. Um, so when that comes back to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, his death is symbolic to that teaching that we need to repent. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the death and baptism is the death, burial, and resurrection of the individual. Mm-hmm. Repent, he's buried in, underwater, and then he, he's resurrected again. Well, the resurrection is when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah, not just when we come up out of the water. It's, but it's, it's a, it's a re- rebirth or what are you going to, you know. Because yeah. Christ went into the grave and he, he was. Came back out three days out, later. Yeah. Right. That was his, his resurrection. But before uh, he did that, he went, yeah, he went in and took the keys to the gates of hell and everything else that he did. Yeah. So that whole salvation of repentance, baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit aligns with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. But that's a physical thing that we humans can do. Right. To well, a spiritual thing that we can do that aligns well, with it's, it's his a, physical. A, our baptism is a, it's a physical thing. That right. We, we do. Yeah. But we don't physically die. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. But Obviously. We, we do, you know, well, if we hold him under long enough. Well, there you go. <laughs> That could happen. <laughs> then, you, then you will be praying for a miracle. <laughs> Hold them under long enough. Oh, my it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbolic, I don't know use that word because it's really yeah. like a, a physical manifestation of a spiritual experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's a lot of times people will think, you know, well, baptism isn't necessary. But the Bible says they commanded them to be baptized. And it was a command. So baptism is necessary because it's Good through. For Jesus, it's <laughs> well, it's also where the blood is then applied, right? Because he was the one that died. And the Bible says that when he died on the cross, the veil or his flesh was ripped. Right. And he took his blood. When he went into heaven, that's where God's throne was. It was no longer on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. So he took his blood. Because before they took the blood of the lamb behind the veil, the high priest did, right? And put the blood on the mercy seat. But Jesus, when he died, when he went into heaven, he put his blood on the mercy seat on the throne of God. And I think that's what people always don't understand is that that physical, 
typical temple setup that they had in the Old Testament wasn't something that died with the time. That would be a good idea to have down there on Earth. But instead, it was shattered after a heavenly example. Yeah. And so that's what you have to think about. What does that look like? Yeah. So I really believe that those were the first two key doctrines that they taught. Who Jesus was. And how do we enter into a covenant? Again, God is a God of promises. The promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Right? Um, The Comforter, that's the Holy Ghost, shall come. uh, Jesus talked about in John chapter 14. Go ahead. Well, I guess it just came to me. Obviously, Jesus did need to be baptized. So the mission was his. But it was going to be... Well, you didn't get baptized, did you? Well, the Bible. No, I mean, <laughs> right. People were going to do that, so it was sort of, you know, just do as I do. Yeah. And also, it says, I think I read the scripture last week, and it's found in, I think it was in Matthew, but it says he did this to fulfill all righteousness. He came, and, and John, what did John say? He says, you don't need to be baptized. I need to be baptized by you. Yeah. yeah. But Jesus said, suffer it to be for right now and it says he did it to fulfill all righteousness because he w- he was entering into that ministry and obviously at that point of course he was Jesus so he didn't need to be saved he had never sinned he never did sin um, but it was entering into that that ministry and that example of ministry and so when we are baptized the Bible says it is for Peter said be baptized for the remission of your sins and that's important to know because that, I, that word is important to correlate with another verse we're going to read. So it's almost eight. So let's, let's look forward to that. So the first thing they taught was the power and authority in the name of Jesus. The second thing they taught was what they had to do to be saved. Interestingly, just a chapter later in Acts 3, and I'm just going to read verses 16 and 19. It says in Acts 3, 16, when the... Um, when the impotent man was healed at the beautiful gate temple, right? And they all came around and said, hey, how did this happen? And we know he's never walked. And his parents even said, he's 40, ask him. You know, we don't want nothing to do with this. We don't want to get kicked out. And uh, G- Peter preached to them. He, he had a sermon from verse 11 to 15. And he ended it with, but you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And verse 16, he preaches the first doctrine again. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And then he says a few more things. And so what does he tell them in verse 19? Repent Repent and be converted Mm -hmm. that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Presence of the Lord. Repentance, be converted, have your sins blotted out, represents that baptism. And the times of refreshing is God's spirit coming into them. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you. So again, in Acts chapter 3, he, he preaches those same two first doctrines. Um, so with that, we find the ability to fill, fulfill really the moral law of God, which is in the Ten Commandments that we talked about to begin with. Once we know who he is and we enter into that covenant relationship, and I started talking about that, the covenant because that blood is a covenant, right? Um, in the Old Testament, it was the blood of bulls and goats, but Hebrews talks about that. It says they just pushed the sins ahead for a year. But now through the blood of Jesus Christ, it's done once, not brought into remembrance year after year. And that's a perfect example of what you talked about, where it says once through the name of Jesus Christ in Hebrews, meaning we only need to be baptized once because we're washed continually through the watering of the word. We still may need to repent if we sin, right? What did, uh, I think it was in First or Second John, my little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is just to forgive us of all sin. He wasn't writing to unsaved people because unsaved people sin. 
right? He said, I write unto you that you don't sin. He's writing to the church, my little children. So if we do sin again after being born again, we repent, right? And then we're washed by the watering of the word because Hebrews, and I apologize, I don't have the exact verse. I think it's in Hebrews 14. Um, it talks about that of only having to do it once for all. You want to see if you can find that one? So um, we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior through faith, and we respond in obedience to his grace, and we become empowered by his spirit. And, um, again, we see that example time after time throughout the Old Testament. Um, what's that? There is no he did, is it only goes to Hebrews 12. Hello. Yeah. It goes to 13. Okay. Just turn to Hebrews 14. We will be here all night. I admit I do not have the Bible memorized. It's where he talks about um, once for all. Talking about Jesus, Jesus and going into that. Um, is it what? 1227. What's it say? And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of these things now and forever. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, if she finds it, if not, I'll look it up and I'll bring it next week. Um, so one of the great greatest doctrines in the New Testament is, of course, that doctrine of grace. We're saved by grace. 2 to 10 and 10. 10 to 10? Go ahead. Yes, we're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And it doesn't say something about not the remembrance every year. Um, don't you think it probably caused quite a stir for these Jewish folks to put, come into the temple and bring in their oh, yeah. and goats and their yeah. pigeons? And I mean, what did they do to the veil? Did they say, hey, wait, we got to yeah, right. Sew this thing up. Right. <laughs> Well, imagine the poor high priest that was on duty that day. Oh, right. He probably... Exactly. He, he died, probably had a heart he died at the time of the evening sacrifice, 3 p.m. Yeah. So, although you didn't go into the Holy of Holies all the time, but he was probably ministering... He was ministering the, the table of showbread, the altar right. of incense. Well, the, he, they must have known something was going on. The whole earth got dark. It right? got and dark. People were raised from the dead. Earthquakes, it was... Wow. Which chapter were you in? I was in Hebrews 10 and 10. 10 and 10. Yeah, it, it goes on. It says, every, high, every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Right. Yeah. So for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. But I think verse 10 is the one I was thinking of. Yeah, so no wonder the disciples were, you know, sought after to bring them up and to, you know, beat them and put them in prison. Oh, yeah, they're taking they their were, jobs away. Right, their yeah. livelihood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, they and they're not only just their livelihood, but their, uh, you know, I mean, that was that was one thing that probably – like I talked about before, I think maybe it was on Sunday, it, the only way you could be a priest is if you were born of the tribe of Levi, you know? So that's, you know, they didn't have no inheritance otherwise. They were probably still looking for all of those things, you know, because that's oh, right. how they received yeah. their stuff in the priesthood. Yeah, right. Now, it doesn't say that there's still no callings and offices and stuff in the New Testament. It was just very different. So, oh, yeah, they didn't, what they did not like it. You know, yeah. Even when Jesus went through the temple, yeah, because they found a lot of interesting <laughs> ways to make money. <laughs> um, so uh, that doctrine of grace, that word grace means graciousness as gratifying a manner or act, um, especially the divine influence upon the heart and it, the reflection of life. So another way I've heard it explained is it's like unmerited favor. We, we didn't do anything to deserve this. 
It's just God's grace because he loves us. And so his grace for us is that he provided the sacrifice, the opportunity, so we didn't have to pay the penalty for sin. That's grace. But we're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians says. Not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. So it's nothing we do to earn it, but we do follow in God's word in obedience. And so we have to understand that there's a difference in the Bible between obedience and works. Um, let's look at that real quick. God's grace to us is the fact he took our place, like I said, and that new birth relationship which we have to receive through obedience and faith. Acts 5 and 32 says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. We need the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, the Bible says. So the Holy Ghost is definitely needful to be saved. And if it's a grace, how do we receive it? We receive it through obe obedience, just like um, Abraham's righteousness was through obedience. So it says, we are his witnesses, so is the Holy Ghost, whom God had given to them that obey him. Also Hebrews 5 and 9. And being made perfect, speaking of Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them, not that believe in him, not that accept him as their Lord and Savior, but unto all them that obey him, the Bible says. So if the disciples taught what Jesus taught, then this aligns with that thought. Uh, Jesus came teaching repentance. We talked about that. John 3 and 3. Do you want to get that quick? And read through verse 7. It's going to talk where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about being born again. John 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 8. Through 7, yep. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born if he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. You must be. So that's that new birth. So when we're born again and filled with the Spirit of Jesus, then we can have the power to live for him. And to understand his word. And of course we understand that born of the water is baptism. And born of the spirit is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some people will say being born of the water is your natural childbirth when the water breaks. But why would he say you must be born again? Why would that be a requirement if that's the only way you can be born? So he's talking about baptism in that. And then uh, receiving the power, we talked about Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That was Jesus, uh, Luke, recounting what Jesus said. And then, so we receive power with the Holy Ghost, but also, to be witnesses, also Jesus said in John 16 and 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So I believe it's possible to not have the Holy Ghost and understand some of the Bible, obviously. But I do also believe that when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Jesus will continually enlighten our understanding and draw us deeper into his word and into that relationship with him. And and that's a continued thing. Well, it's the mind of, the mind of God. Yeah. The mind of God. Right, but it's not something that just all of a sudden he just opens up the top of your head and dumps everything in. I think our brain would explode. You know, it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a growth thing. Well, and that's where he talks about you and James. You know, draw nigh unto me. Right? And I'll draw nigh unto you. Right. Yeah. Let him enter by my veins. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's finish this up because I hear people out and about. So they taught. Uh, those two things, I believe those were the two first doctrines 
of who Jesus was and the doctrine of salvation. They taught on faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 4, 23 through 31 all talks about having faith when they prayed after they came back and they were being persecuted already after that first man and they prayed and they said, God, you've seen this. Now have your way in whatever's going on. They quote one of the Psalms as they're talking about this and the Bible says the place was shaken and they left and preached with boldness. In uh, 32 of chapter 4 through 5 and 11, they were taught about giving. We talked about how uh, they came together and had all things common. And also there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira in there, which is also very interesting if you've never read that. Um, there's some other teaching that uh, I just want to finish up with, and we're not going to go too far into detail, but I guess as much as anybody wants to talk about it. Acts 15 and 22. Now this is later on, and the Gentiles are starting to receive the gospel, more so than just the household of Cornelius, but now in other places, uh, Antioch and all over. And there's Jews who are telling them, oh man, you got to become a Jew. You got to be a proselyte. You got to do all this law of Moses, right? And Paul is saying, no, 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 you don't. And so there's some contention. So Paul brought it before the elders. Hey, there's these other ones that are trying to say these people, they got to be circumcised and do all these things. So it says in Acts 15 and 22, it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles, the elders, and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain, meaning certain people, which went out from us, our own people, have troubled you, with words subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. We never said that. So it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So that not only did they get a letter, but they're going to read the letter to him. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Of course, aside from uh, salvation and other things. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only things they had to follow. It just means, according to the law of Moses, these are the things that we want you to do. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't got to worry about all these other things. But he said, abstain from meats offered to idols. Now, we know Paul had a whole teaching on that. They're dumb idols. And it's just food. And if you're big enough to handle it, that's fine. But if you have somebody with you, and we know that the Gentiles were a little bit weak, and that's the lifestyle and the rituals they came out of, so they said abstain from that. Don't, don't get involved in that. Also from blood, don't eat blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, God said in Leviticus. Stay away from things strangled. I don't want you to eat dead things along the road. <laughs> and plus... We want the blood drained out. We don't want it just soaking in its own blood. So God was very specific about that. And from fornications, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. So I just thought that those things were kind of interesting to bring in. They weren't necessarily teachings of the whole church, but to that those Gentiles that were being kind of confused by people coming in saying you got to keep the whole law of Moses. He said these are some things you are supposed to do. So yeah, I know that's a whole different yeah. other subject. Oh, it's, so it's there's so much, yeah. There's so much. Um and I think it's interesting that there is a lot of cultures today that eat blood. Blood sausage mm -hmm. and blood uh, pudding. Blood pudding. Yeah. No reason. Blood yeah. Pudding. Uh, Grub? K L U B. What a crow. <laughs> Yuck. Yuck is another pronunciation. I don't know, I'm it. Uh, wow. So, um, there are, of course, many other teachings. We're going to talk about a few of them uh, next week, and they're found throughout the epistles that deal with culture and deal with a lot of different things. But 
some of the main ones uh, are the ones we're going to cover. Of course, it would take a long time to go through all of it, but that's why we're supposed to study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Jesus, thank you, God, for your word tonight. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the patience of your people, God, and help us to continually wait upon you, God, that our strength would be renewed, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And there's quite a land in there, Pastor. Well...